So thank you so much. So we're now going to move into a panel discussion. And I'd just like to invite the panelists for us to just come up and, and get comfortable. If anyone wants to stand up and have a stretch while they're doing that, please feel free. So our chair is, is uh, Vishvapani Blomfield, who lives in Cardiff and teaches both mindfulness and Buddhism. He's the author of Gautama Buddha, The Life and Teachings of the Awakened One. And you might know him as a very regular contributor to Thought for the Day on Radio 4 since 2006. As a mindfulness teacher, among other things, he has pioneered mindfulness teaching in prison and probation settings in the UK. And he's currently the director of the Mindfulness Initiative in Wales. So I will hand over to Vishwapani. Um, I'm going to show you something that, I, uh, that caught my eye uh, as I was looking at, at the news in the news agent yesterday. Uh, this is mindfulness in public discourse. Snowflake kids get lessons in chilling. <laughs> and uh, the, that's it, actually. That is just about the story. There's, there's two paragraphs on page 15 where Anne Widdicombe says, it's obviously not what any of the children have asked for. It's nonsense. Children should focus on work because we know that what children always ask for is the, the opportunity to focus on work. Uh, snowflake, by the way, means uh, sort of precious and fragile and unique and distinct and all of that. So those elements of uh, how mindfulness is perceived are, are still there. But we've heard from um, Rachel, uh, from Dan and Joe today, and we're going to have more comment from, from the members of the panel. So we have Alison Armstrong. Um, Alison gained a PhD in social psychology, exploring the links between consumer behavior and mindfulness. Um, she offers research in mindfulness and, health and mental health training through Present Minds and is director of research for a charity looking into well-being and older age. Byron, uh, Byron Lee is an educator and mindfulness teacher specializing in inclusion and leadership. He works with individuals, teams, organizations and communities um, to adapt uh, how they operate in a, to a diverse, complex and changing world. He delivers compassionate, inclusive leadership programs in the NHS and elsewhere and supports sustainable and, mindfulness and mindful approaches to equity, inclusion, and social justice. So um, I've got to know Byron through the Mindfulness Initiative, and I've got to know Stephen, uh, final um, uh, panel member, because we uh, are both in Cardiff. Stephen is the senior lecturer in the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University. Um, and his research concerns include the therapeutic cultures of late modernity. I hope he'll be explaining what that means. Um, he is the co-editor of the Handbook of Eth the Ethical Foundations of Mindfulness and is currently leading a study mapping the mindfulness movement in the UK. So we have... A lot of expertise here. Um, I, I'm chairing the discussion, but I'm also participating in it, which actually means I have to chair myself. Um, I'm just going to say a few minutes, uh, say a, a few words to, to start us off. Um, and I thought actually rather than, I thought perhaps the, the most helpful thing I can do is to just remind us of some of the things that have already been said. So this, and this panel discussion is entering the, the dialogue we've already been having. So I think most of you have been here all day. We started with Dan's paper, or a, a, a summary of a paper, which I look forward to reading in full. Um, and he talked about the, the significance of mindfulness in, in three ways. The importance you know, for society as a whole in the capacity to pay attention, to, and secondly, to connect with our deeper values, and thirdly, to take a wider pers perspective, suggesting that these are um, transformational qualities for what uh, can make for a, a better society. 
Um, so then we had Joe, and uh, Joe was talking about mindfulness as a historical object. So she was inviting us, at least I felt I had been invited, to stand back from the, the, the assumptions that we have through our experience of, the world, of, of this mindfulness world. Um, with the reflection that who you think you are and what you think you're doing <coughs> affects what you are, affects, um, affects things, particularly in relation to mindfulness. And that our view of mindfulness is influenced by changing views of self, particularly the sense that the self is malleable. So that's something that's the context in which mindfulness has emerged. And that this also connects with prior ways of thinking about the mind and, and particularly about Buddhism that are firstly modernist and secondly romantic. So that was a very rich source of um, stimulation and reflection. So then uh, at this point, you know, I think a lot of us start to ask, well, how much do we know about what mindfulness is? Can we simply propose it as a foundational capacity for society, as Dan was suggesting. Um, Rachel reiterated some of those same concerns, asking really, um, well, starting with the sense that we need different models for what mindfulness is. Not assuming that we know what the mind is, what mindfulness is, what emotion is, um, and that these models... Uh, the, the mindfulness comes packaged with a set of models and perhaps if we look at those models and we seek how we might reframe mindfulness for different settings, um, we can, we can uh, help make it more relevant, more potent and address some of the underlying assumptions in each of these models. And um, then Rachel moved on to the the question of what it really is like to try and change things in government and what she feels she, you know, she can contribute under the, that general rubric of mindfulness. And that turns out to be a lot to do with what it is to be a human being and someone who's at, involved in government. It's, it means being, involved, being aware of emotions, of... Um, communication and particularly the need for difficult conversations and then also the, the systems and structures within which work takes place. So mindfulness you know, in Rachel's work has that setting. So then the question of how we can take mindfulness and apply it to society has, you know, I think from what we've heard has become increasingly rich and multifaceted. Depends how you understand mindfulness, depends how you understand society, depends on how you frame the whole thing. So I found this very uh, rich source of reflections already. And I hope that in our uh, discussion we'll be both picking up some of those themes and adding our own perspectives. So I'm not going to say any more from myself about what I think about it all. Um, but I will introduce the question that, that we've suggested to the, the different people on the panel uh, that they discuss. The question is, and we, we've, Tessa and I worked this out, and it's quite a, a deliberately broad question. What difference does mindfulness make to how we think about society and engage with its challenges? What difference does mindfulness make to how we think about society and engage with its challenges. Okay? So I'm going to invite Stephen to go first. Is that okay? And then we'll yeah. work down the line. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thanks, Fish Rapani, and thanks, Tessa, for organizing what I think is a great event. Um, I've really enjoyed it so far. So my name's Stephen Stanley. Um, I'm a social scientist. I'm also a scholar practitioner, uh, I would say, at Cardiff University. And I'm leading, as Vishwapani said, this three-year social study of the UK mindfulness movement uh, that's funded by the Leverhulme Trust. And our mapping mindfulness project is studying the people, places, and practices that make up the UK mindfulness scene. 
thousands of scientific studies have been conducted evidencing the therapeutic efficacy of mindfulness. But we're mostly in the dark, really, when it comes to understanding mindfulness as a movement and as a social phenomenon. Uh, we don't know the answer to basic questions about the provision of mindfulness, such as who, where, what, why, and how, and what it means for the broader society. So if mindfulness is a movement, what kind of movement is it? Is it a therapeutic culture, a professional industry, or a social movement? Is mindfulness best understood as secular, spiritual, religious, or something new entirely? And indeed, what does it make to mean to make a mindful nation during times of Brexit? You, you would think you'd escape Brexit with mindfulness, but as we found in our research, and Joe's found too, you don't. <laughs> so we're studying the community of teachers, trainers, coaches, supervisors, advocates, and policy, policy makers, the people leading uh, the mindfulness movement and bringing mindfulness into the population. And just out of interest, um, how many of you here are mindfulness teachers? You teach mindfulness in some capacity or context? Maybe about half, half of us. And how many of you are in researchers? You, so you're engaged in researching mindfulness? Smaller number. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is what social scientists do. <laughs> <laughs> Discourse about mindfulness in scientific, professional, and popular fora, I've never used that word before, but now's the time to use it, uh, tends to be characterized by polemics. And I want to present what I think are five of the most common positions on mindfulness in public discourse in a somewhat stark way uh, to prompt debate and discussion. So the first is where evangelical corporate business advocates market smartphone mindfulness apps as a magic bullet panacea to ensure global mental health and world peace. Uh, Chade Meng Tan illustrates that position in his book, uh, Search Inside Yourself. He was uh, the one behind Google's uh, mindfulness program. Secondly, critics uh, say that muck mindfulness, sold as a stress reduction technique in workplace settings, is a capitalist bandwagon designed to distract our attention from systemic sources of suffering and make us all individually responsible for our health and illness. Thirdly, professional practitioners tend to present mindfulness as a universal human capacity, trained through mindfulness-based applications, which comprise ancient wisdom and are evidenced by modern science as being effective therapeutic interventions. There's two more. Uh, fourthly, Buddhists are concerned that the ethics of mindfulness, when it is taught in a secular way, might have been lost in translation and therefore should be better tied to their Buddhist roots. Other Buddhists think mindfulness courses teach the essence of the Dharma, but without the Buddhist religious and cultural baggage that comes with it. And fifthly, and, and finally, although there are many others, uh, proponents and critics alike variously celebrate or fear, depending on their perspective, that mindfulness is some kind of Trojan horse, or I heard it described recently as a Trojan mole, which is a kind of cuter version. Uh, a crypto-Buddhist secular religion being wheeled by stealth undercover into public institutions like schools, hospitals, prisons, and governments. This is especially a big fear in the United States where there are legal battles going on about mindfulness in schools. So our project, our Leverhulme project, um, which we have some flyers for, seeks to ground our understanding of mindfulness as a movement by studying mindfulness teachers' views, experiences, and practices on the ground. We want to bring more nuance, more context, and balance, uh, and attention to social, cultural, and historical uh, contexts. So moving beyond the hype and the polemics in many ways. What really matters to mindfulness teachers? This question was posed before. So 
So we'd love to discover more about mindfulness teachers' perspectives, their backgrounds, what, what they're teaching, why they're teaching and practicing in their various contexts of mindfulness provision and practice, both personally and professionally. So if you like the sound of this and you're one of the mindfulness teachers who put your hand up, this is my Christmas appeal, <laughs> you could say. If you'd like to have your voice included in our project, please do take a flyer. They're on the front desk and I have a bunch of them. Or visit our website, which has just been relaunched, which is www.mappingmindfulness.net. <laughs> www.mappingmindfulness.net. We want to know what does mindfulness mean to you as mindfulness teachers. Thank you for indulging me in my Christmas appeal. <laughs> Thanks so much. Byron. Yeah, thanks, Vishupani. Um, so thank you, Stephen. Um, so I, I was listening to something that Rachel was saying about you know, your, the context, your own context kind of sort, of sort of frames things. So I thought maybe put the context of my work in relation to mindfulness, because that seems really important. Um, so I've spent my professional life most of my professional life involved in work around inclusion and uh, equalities work and, and, and there have been other people in the room as well who's probably been involved in that kind of work and the thing that's often really struck me about th this area of work is that um, most people have an opinion when it comes to this what I'm often struck is that people generally don't have a good understanding and I think this is often one of the particular challenges you face, particularly when we start talking about where, well, how can mindfulness help to inform this conversation. So I guess I maybe want to share a couple of observations of on my own over the last work in this area for only 30 years around the sort of dangers and risks that mindfulness might find itself falling into that other people have already failed themselves in the past. And maybe it's also maybe some of the opportunities mindfulness might have to address some of those things in a different way. So I'm going to refer to um, a couple of, of, of authors, and if anyone's interested, there's a, there's a huge lineage of really good writers in this field that, again, I think people often don't refer to, um, who often do challenge people's perspective of the world. So I'm going to refer to some of the writing of a woman called Ayn Ang, who talked about um, the importance of, of navigating cultural complexity. And what you tend to find in particularly policy making is there is a, there is a, a reaction to complexity, which is to, re to resolve a sense of overwhelm by going for simplistic solutions. And when you look at policy and practice in this area, particularly when we start talking about inclusion, most of those things are well-intentioned, but are often very simplistic. And the danger of simplistic approaches is that people they somehow feel like there should be a degree of gratitude for those who are trying to help, in a sense that this is for you, rather than saying, yes, but that's not what we were asking for. So something quite interesting about the dynamic of that. Um, and, and what she talks about is something described as sophisticated simplifications. Um, I, I'm a great fan of George Box's quote, who, who's, who was a statistician, who turned around and said, you know, all models are wrong, it's just some of them are useful. Um, and, and while that sounds a bit of heresy to people who spend a lot of time creating their moral, models, for me there's something about the pragmatism that fits with this particular agenda, is that if you're thinking about what works, then you have to ask yourself what works in this context. So for example, you know, with great faith in the kind of research, research methodologies, you create an eight-week program that appears to work with the population you used to do your research, then you take it to community, and somehow it's not working the same way. But the question you need to ask yourself is, to what extent was this designed with these people in mind, um, rather than saying there's a problem with this particular community? So there's something really interesting about the nature of the narrative that we have around that. The other thing which I'll share with you is an observation which I think the mindfulness community as well needs to be aware of, particularly in terms of where it's going, is. Is, uh, is the wonderful TED talk that some of you may have come across by um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie around the danger of the single story. Um, and the particular uh, uh, area around the danger of the single story was, was emphasized this, this idea that um, what we do is we write narratives based upon the position of, of, of where we are in the story. And the danger of the single story, particularly around mindfulness, is that uh, if, you're, if your intentions are benevolent, therefore you can do no harm. And I think it's really, really important to kind of start engaging the conversation about, well, going back to the point made earlier about what's the intention behind what we're trying to do in relation to the different communities which you're wanting to engage. So for me, sometimes it's about re reframing how we view things, particularly in light of some of the things we might observe. So, for example, we often talk about disadvantaged or marginalised communities. Um, if you just reframe that in a different way, so, for example, underinvested communities, 
would change our emphasis to understanding, well, who do we then need to approach to resolve this? The communities themselves or the people who are meant to be investing the money? Yeah. Who do we need to teach in mindfulness to? The people who are affected by it or the people who are making the decisions in the first place? So there's something about recognizing that these things have been explored in the past, by the way. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is that there's lots of lessons being learned to avoid situations that you could replicate by simply looking about what people have identified. And I think the opportunity of mindfulness, particularly around the more sophisticated thinking and perspectivism, I think the potential is huge uh, in terms of a different way of engaging these conversations. I'll pause there. I was told to be less than five minutes, so I'm not timing myself. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay, Alison. Okay, good afternoon. Okay, is that better? Okay. Um, yeah, good afternoon. So I'm Alison Armstrong, and um, feeling a little bit of the lone female up here. Um, my, um, my starting point, really, for coming into doing research on mindfulness was to bring together my meditation and yoga experience and also my... Uh, views on ecological issues um, and by necessity a PhD has to narrow and so I looked uh, in the end at um, consumer behavior um, and the with the obvious side that when we consume a lot of stuff we're doing a lot of environmental and ecological damage and what could mindfulness offer um, so there were lots of things that came out of that in terms of um, the, the way we use consumer goods in order to define and express our identity, uh, the way we use consumer goods, uh, at least some people use that for emotion regulation. And therefore, if mindfulness helps us to be clear about our sense of identity um, and also to have a sense of uh, our value and to have emotion regulation within it, then it was going to be a helpful thing. My study was very small, um, but, but quite in depth, and, and there were some positive things to be seen from that. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that more if, if there's the interest. Um, I finished the PhD six years ago, and I think it's perhaps helpful to uh, reflect on the fact that, that I'm now in a state where I'm not quite sure what I mean by mindfulness or where I sit in being a mindfulness teacher and what I'm offering. Um, so I took a step back from teaching. I uh, took a step back from academia um, and I returned to my own practice. And what I found was that my ongoing mindfulness practice had felt was feeling dry and it was feeling um, clinical. And so I went further back and rediscovered my yoga roots. And when I talk about yoga, I'm, I'm not talking about a weekly exercise class. You know, I'm talking about the bigger sense of yoga um, as a broad spiritual practice and as a, if you like, a lifestyle. And I found a richness there that I hadn't found in mindfulness. On stepping back out of the mindfulness world, I also noticed, uh, and I'd been saying this for years, but noticed even more clearly, um, class issues, um, the economics around mindfulness. I found it increasingly difficult to stay so-called up-to-date with um, the training that I was supposed to be doing in order to stay registered as, as you know, a mindfulness teacher. I, I found they... And this is just a personal reflection, and, and it's just what I've observed over the last couple of years. Um, I noticed that my, it feels a little bit that even though we haven't fully defined what mindfulness is, we're selling it, and we're sometimes overselling it. And there is this turning mindfulness into um, something that is a commodity. And I'm, I'm on these, all these email lists where you get all these updates, and I don't, to be honest, read them all. Um, I, I hardly read any. And I was fairly horrified last month when, I don't know who it came from, but there was a, uh, a mindfulness email coming out with the words also in the email of Black Friday. And it's where we start to see... That, that how mindfulness gets co-opted by these kind of materialistic values that are broadly in society. So I don't think I've answered the question I was posed. I just wanted to open up a few things that I'm noticing, and I'm really happy to talk more about my research, which probably does more closely answer the question. But these are some of the things I'm noticing. And I still teach mindfulness, by the way, um, and I'm still very happy to do so, but what I've done is narrowed 
the context into which I offer mindfulness, which is much more the context that I'm comfortable in and, and understand. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, th I think um, what we can do is I'd like to um, say a few things for my own, and then I think we'll just open it up to, uh, to questions. And um, this is really our opportunity for a plenary for, for the, in relation to the things that we've said, but also in relation to the whole day. So, um, as we talk about these things, as we think about things, they, they, they become more and more complicated. And I, I certainly recognize and resonate with the concerns that have been expressed about mindfulness. But, you know, I, um, I also want to just come back to why I'm a mindfulness teacher myself. I mean, my background is as a Buddhist, and, well, you know, it's a way for me to earn a living. Um, but that's not enough, actually. The reason I do it is that it... F and I, what I, So maybe I'll just say a little bit about what I do. I teach in quite a lot of different contexts. I teach MBCT courses. I sometimes teach Breathworks courses. I teach... Um, I sometimes find myself going into prisons. I do quite a lot of work with men on probation, coming out of prison. I am very interested in developing mindfulness for community settings and peer mindfulness. I'm interested in training people in communities to be able to share mindfulness. So I find myself doing a lot. But the, the key to it for me, and I think I would generalize this, the, the reason that this is spreading so effectively is uh, what, I, what I mentioned to Joe earlier and that, that when I asked a question. It's suffering. You know, people come on, a, on my mindfulness courses because in some way they're suffering with depression, anxiety, stress, whatever it might be. And that is a motivator. You know, a lot of the more abstract things about well-being might be a nice idea, but the fact that I'm experiencing... Um, intense personal or emotional suffering, either now or if I'm you know, in danger of relapsing, I have in the past and I'm, I fear that again. That is the heart of it. Um, and mine, the, you know, the John Kabat-Zinn and Mark Williams and those people have, I'm very happy to say, uh, been able to adapt you know, distill something that, that actually works and helps people, gives people tools that really help them address their suffering. Um, it also interests me as a basis for social change because where, you know, uh, global warming is, for, for most of us, something of a, an abstraction. I mean, obviously it's real, but we don't feel it in the way that we feel our mental anguish. So it's uh, a starting point for, for a wider kind of change. Um, so this rubbish in the Daily Star, um, I don't know how seriously it really needs to be taken. Snowflake, kids get lessons in chilling. What's wrong with that, and what's wrong with Anne Whitcomb's comment on it, is the reality that children are experiencing so much mental distress. You know, and in Wales, we've got Liz Williams here, who is really the powerhouse behind what is quite a revolution in education in Wales, or, or at least potentially. Um, there's so much interest in schools, and because the needs are so great. Um, mindfulness then speaks to people individually in their minds and I, I know that that is a problem for some people. it's not so much of a problem for me coming from a Buddhist perspective because that's what Buddhism's always done it started with the individual in their mind but it does raise the question for me uh, it raises lots of questions can we analogize you see an analogy between the individual and our patterns and our, our own suffering and societal suffering um, there's, and we're, we've also been hovering around issues around values and ethics 
um, and views of the mind. And um, again, I, I, I'm not sure how much to say now, but I, I, you know, my own perspective is, is from a Buddhist perspective where um, the mind is very much seen as an, eth an ethical domain. And our values and our actions spring from our states of mind within the context of Buddhist psychology. So um, I come back again to that, that starting point, which is suffering. And the, you know, I teach mindfulness out of a faith that bringing awareness to suffering is a key to um, many of the other issues that we've been talking about. Societal issues, uh, personal issues, and, and, and what in the end are ethical issues. So that's my little bit. Um, thanks to everyone for saying their little bit. And I think uh, we need to open it out now. So do we have a mic roving around somewhere? Roaming, roving, whatever mics do. Um, we have a, a, a mic and a roaming. So yes. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers. It's been a super rich uh, day. Um, I wanted to really make a comment and then maybe ask for your views. Um, um, I'm quite concerned about talking about cultivating a flourishing society, investing in human consciousness, and the concern of human suffering without hearing us doing more of a sort of social political analysis of why we're suffering um, who is suffering and who is getting to ask those questions. Um, so I guess I'm <coughs> wanting to advocate that um, actually the mindfulness movement itself is swimming in a social, political, economic and a historical context and that we need to be recognising the context in which we're in in order to recognise what impact um, the work that we have is doing. Um, and I'm, it, I find it really interesting coming a little bit more from that perspective, when we talk about mindfulness in schools, my mind automatically goes to, well, if kids are stressed in schools, what are we doing about the provision of schooling, the education system, trainers? When we talk about working with marginalized communities, my mind goes to, um, well, why are they marginalized? Um, and are we working with um, uh, polit politicians or power holders on, on, on how mindfulness can support a deeper inquiry into how we might actually be maintaining um, power and privilege. So for me, um, I guess I'm, I'm referring back to a question that Tessa brought in at the beginning, which is, is mindfulness neutral? And for me, it's, it's mindfulness might be neutral, but the, mind, the, the way that mindfulness is taught or funded or promoted as part of movement is political, because when we make decisions about whether we work with the kids or whether we work with the politicians or whether we work with um, people who work within a corporation or whether we work with the um, shareholders of that organization or the CEOs, that is actually a political decision. So I'd love to um, get a little bit of views. And I, I, I have to say, I know that Stephen has lots of very good things to say about this topic. So I'd love, I'd love for one of the people to hear from would, would be Stephen, because I'm sure you'd articulate these points much better than me and, and any others that have views. Thank you. OK, so you'd particularly like to hear from Stephen? And um, then we'll see who else. Well, given that I've got so much to say on this, I'll keep it really brief. <laughs> um, and it's just one point that came to mind as you were speaking is that one of the potential reasons for that kind of focus on, you know, the, the psychological, on, on personal well-being, uh, on the individual of, of the mindfulness world and, and the focus on, on mental health and, and so on is partly to do with the research and the focus of research. Um, I think if we think historically, I, th I think one of the big carriers for mindfulness historically is psychology. And I mean psychology in its broadest sense, you know, the discipline of psychology and also psychotherapy, um, psychoanalysis even actually, if you look back historically. Um, and so psycho psychology, neuroscience, they really are the key forms of research that are active in this area. There's very little social science and humanities research in this field. So even to ask basic questions like why are people taking a course in mindfulness? Most studies are not really looking at that 
actually, um, when those thousands of studies that have been published on mindfulness, very few of them take a more social angle, which would even ask questions like that to find out from people, why are you taking a course in mindfulness? So I think that's part of the issue. And I think the other issue, which I think people have kind of mentioned, but maybe we just need to name it, is the political economy uh, um, aspect um, and the kind of parallel rise of what's been called you know, neoliberal forms of political economy. And they do parallel the rise of mindfulness in the West quite closely. And I think that's the broader narrative that we need to take into account, especially when we're evaluating the MUC mindfulness critiques, um, like um, Alison was discussing as well. So those that would just be two really brief things I would say, and I can go on and on about it, but I won't. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'll, um, thank you, Steve. And so, uh, thank you, Paula, for the question. Uh, this, um, for me, it's... A, it's um... So there is a bit of research that shows that when mindfulness programs have been taught within communities, particularly communities of, of, of people who have often described as being marginalised, so, for example, when they look at issues around race, one of the, one of the feedback, quite often the feedback, is that those courses have lacked an acknowledgement of the other things that people have actually struggled with. Um, and it hasn't been acknowledged within the kind of mindfulness teaching itself. It wasn't that mindfulness teaching wasn't helpful, it was the fact that lack of acknowledgement and exploration with any skill. And I think that's something I think the mindfulness, you know, again, talking about mindfulness as a social process of change, is that the, it, it also needs to have the capacity to acknowledge its limitations. You know, when we talk about mindfulness, about describing things as they are rather than what we think they should be. And I think there's a degree, because the, there's a very really important difference between, we talked earlier about empathy, and there's a really interesting difference between empathy and cultural humility. And humility forms a very important part of, the, of mindfulness teachings, but also it's a really important part of how we engage with some of these particular topics. You know, do we bring an element of cultural humility in this kind of shared learning experience? And, and I was sharing with Dan earlier about this idea of co-creation, and one of the problems with co-creation through empathy and attention is it, it's an afterthought. You know, one of my criticisms of many organisations when they start considering issues around race, race gender, etc., it's done as an afterthought. And it becomes an afterthought, by the way, it's because those people who are poli making policy decisions, it's not their lived experience. And as soon as you engage with people who is their lived experience, they don't use the same language that people use within policy making. They don't talk about these challenges, they talk about life. People talk about why do they not attend events? Well, they're busy getting on with life, you know. So there's a very different narrative needs to be had. And if you want to engage communities, don't hold events where people have to come to. Go to those communities and have them there because it makes life easier. Because to travel several hours to get somewhere often can be very problematic. So there's a whole range of things you can practically do. So for me, it's, it's about, you know, recognising how things are rather than how they should be. Clearly having a vision of where you want to get to. But that for me, there's a, there's a different kind of narrative that people have. And, and I think sometimes it comes as a surprise to people when they start listening in to school conversations they may have never had before. Yeah. I think I'll just say something about language. Um, you know, I can't help being a white, female, middle class, you know, person. And I think that quite often the way we frame mindfulness interventions, the way we advertise, um, where we put mindfulness on, we're, we're automatically excluding large sections of the population. Um, and so I think there's some really important work there to do. And I think it's very dangerous whenever we think that we're relying on mindfulness to help the individual without looking at the bigger systemic problems. Because mindfulness then turn, as Stephen said, it turns us into, oh, it's my fault that I'm suffering. And therefore, and I should be able to do something about that without taking into account the context into, in which people sit. And some of the challenges that people face that as a white middle class female, I can probably never fully appreciate. So I think there's a, there's a lot of sensitivity that we need around this. And there's a, there's a job to do. I would say, in terms of, it's not just how do we make mindfulness accessible in terms of affordable, but accessible in terms of the language that we use to even talk about it. Mm. Okay. Can I, can I add one? Yes, of course, Gwen. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to something, Alice, which is a really important point, which is this is, there needs to be a conversation also about who are the people that are going to be offering it in those communities. 
because even that conversation itself starts to have this kind of, uh, and I'm going to use this word not to offend anybody, but it, this is something I'm kind of very aware of. There's a risk it becomes kind of like, like a missionary, kind of missionary process. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than saying, no, 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 don't be a missionary, because actually the, even it's benevolent, you're risking it. It's about how those communities are already organizing themselves, which they will be. How those organized communities are already doing mindfulness, which they will be, and how do we then facilitate and engage people and help them do the things they're already doing? Because they're not sitting there passively waiting for someone to come along. It doesn't work that way. And I think the frustration sometimes is when people aren't engaged in those conversations, there are lots of assumptions that people are making. And if you look at the work around mindfulness interaction, which comes from the area around, around uh, from the world of, of cultural studies, the way that they've contextualized mindfulness is very different. They talk about honoring indigenous practices as part of the process, which is the origin. So you wouldn't end up with an eight-week program. You'd end up with a co-created program that reflected the needs of those communities. That would be the emphasis. And so there's a very different way of framing these things. That, so just, just kind of reminded me about, just, just wanted to mention that, because I think it's important. And how then do we support that? It's not saying people have to feel, feel somehow offended by that. It's how do we then support that with a genuine desire to change the way that the social fabric is, is made? Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it is a comp, it's a tricky area, you know, and it's an area that I uh, you can't help being aware of these issues. It, you know, for me, I, I've partly just found myself taken into prisons, for example. And on the one hand, I know, I have a sense I'm not the right person. You know, I'm white, male, male doesn't matter. Um, but middle class and English, and this is, I mean, Wales, so all, all those sorts of things. Um, and uh, educated, you know, lots of things that set me apart from people. Sometimes I, I find that there is, I, I feel I need to learn how to make that human connection. And it's often about just, just asking the right questions, you know, that, that enable, that meet people where they're at. What, how do you stay safe in this place? Um, finding that common ground. <clears throat> but I, actually that work has pushed me towards the current project that I'm, I'm developing, which is around how can we uh, train, how can we empower people in these communities, in these peer groups, whether that's a prison or wherever, to be, sharing the mindfulness themselves. I use this term sharing mindfulness rather than teaching mindfulness. Um, and mindfulness really has come into society as a, uh, a bottom-up, as a, a kind of, as a groundswell, you know, but it's groundswell among people like Buddhists, caring professionals, um, so on, teachers, who want something that they can use that will, will meet the suffering that they see in front of them um, in a way that, that, uh, that engages the mind and the mind's capacities. But um, we need a, a wider um, groundswell. We need something that, that, that people in all of our communities can make their own, I think, and find their own language to, to share with each other. Um, the only other, th no, th that's enough. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll dive into that. Thank you very much for organizing this. Um, so I'm Julieta Galante, and I, I am a health, uh, mental health researcher. So <laughs> uh, this is, um, I was very interested in Stephen's comments. Um, I really appreciate the dimension of research and the impact that it had on all, all these development. So what I can say about um, health research leading this, this movement, really not even health, it's re neuroscience is not really so that, that, that much related to health because it's very experimental, but um, all this, this um, psychology perhaps uh, research. So one thing is very practical and it's funding. So it's much easier to get funding for um, applied mental health research or things like that, or even neuroscience or technology than for social sciences. So that's one big thing that we need to take into account. But the other thing is um, the, the purpose of scientific endeavors are, is, is totally different from 
what Joe was saying about social, social science being about explaining the uh, the contexts, which are very different. So in, in um, scientific research, which is related to biology at, it, at its core and to redu the reductionist approaches, it's all about general generalizing things. And in the context of meditation and mindfulness, the assumption that lies uh, behind all this research is that there's an effect that is independent of culture and that it's related to biology. That's why people are looking at um, MRIs and um, doing re research in different countries and not even taking into account whether, you know, we're teaching an MBSR course in China or in, or even in Sri Lanka where like they, they, it's just, you know, totally different to teach an MBSR course there. You were bringing back what they, um, you know, developed in a way or, you know, all this context. But so, so that assumption, I, I would like to talk a bit more, a bit about the assumption of something here being independent of culture. So I think Joe said something in the beginning. Or, Julieta? Yes. Do you have a question? Um, no, <laughs> it's more a comment, really. Okay. Do you mind? Yeah, no, well, let's just hear your comment and, uh, um, and then we can comment on that. Okay, great. So the, the importance of this is we don't yet know whether there is a biological effect independent of culture. I don't think that the research is there yet and we sometimes assume that. So actually that could be transformed into a question. Uh, do, you, do you think that um, there is actually all the members of the panel, are you working on that assumption that there's a universal thing here? Uh, how do you see that point? Okay, so your observation of the field is that there's a, um, an assumption, a widespread assumption that mindfulness is, you can think about it ir uh, independently of culture, yeah? So, you may want, well want to tie it to biology, um, but not to culture. So that's your, and you're ask, and then you're wondering if we've noticed the same thing or we operate within that same sort of assumption. Okay. Anyone like to comment on that? I got a quick comment, which is, uh, are you familiar with the work around cultural neuroscience? So there's, yeah, so there's, so, so, so there's some really interesting findings in around cultural neuroscience. For those who familiar with cultural neuroscience, what they discovered is that to, depending on the cultural environment you're exposed to, the question of structural change is quite debatable, but there's certainly a lot of evidence around functional change in the brain in terms of the cultures you're exposed to. So when you start doing MRI scans of how the brains were functioning, the fact that you have a universal principle about how the brains were functioning with one context may be completely different than other cultural contexts for someone else from another part of the world. So I, I do, and, and that's the reason why a lot of the, a lot of the functional mem, uh, MRI scans and scanning, it's very, very embryonic. And it's very risky to go, and I think there's a lot of the people who teach this stuff have been warning people, mm -hmm. don't over, don't overemphasize what it says. I think I was listening to a lecture once by someone who's a, a neuroscientist who was saying, MRI scan, functional MRI scans, is a bit like taking a helicopter over a city. You can see where the people are, but you have no idea what they're doing there. Um, and it's saying, you know, it, it really is kind of quite, dangerous to make a kind of extrapolation. So, so I, but I do think this area of culture and neuroscience is really interesting in terms of really challenges the idea of universality. And this is why I always go back to this kind of usefulness question, you know, that we can get caught up in a kind of focus on the research. And then I'm sure, you know, academics, and I used to work in the university, this kind of, you can very easily get very blinkered in that rather than asking questions. So how useful is this to the people we're trying to support and help, particularly when we talk about some of the social challenges? I don't have a big answer. I can just give a very little example, which is that the area that I'm really comfortable teaching mindfulness now is within engineering and science, because that is who I was before I went and did a mm. social psychology PhD. I was an engineer for 10 years. And so that's a very tiny microcosm of a culture that I get. And so I think it's important that, I mean, it's already been said today, context is important. The language we use is important. And I think we need to um, situate ourselves within the particular environments in, in which we have some understanding. Hmm. 
Okay. Um, all right, I don't have a comment, so maybe. Yes. Okay, so Jenny, if you don't mind just waiting, there's someone at the back who's yes. been asking for a while. Sorry if I missed you. Okay, Pauline. Hi, um, a number of my questions have been answered, but I just had one other question about assumptions. So when um, the mindfulness world has gone out and approached other um, um, demographics or other, other communities and seldom heard voices, the, the question on approaches that people take um, and this idea that uh, if, if what we're saying, mindfulness is about um, the relief of suffering, is that what the seldom heard voice communities are actually saying that they're looking for? So if that's the basis of what we're going out and, and, and saying to those different communities, is that what they're asking us to do? Or is that something that we're assuming when we go there first? So, that, so that's part one of my questions. And the second one, if that is, then is our approach already um, um, skewed to what we think that they need? rather than we're actually going in to say, well, what is it you're actually looking for? Yeah, okay, so is there an, I, I was the one who used the word assumption. Is that, do you like me to answer in particular, or is it? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, do people want to relieve their suffering? For my own experience, so what, so what I'm doing is actually um, doing exactly that, going into different communities, seldom heard voices, and at the moment I am focusing on the BM, uh, BME um, communities. And if, I took to, if my first step is actually going in to say that actually, why would I want to do it is, is their first question. Um, what's, what is this going to do for my community? So I take the approach of going to the elders. What are you offering that's different to what we're already doing? Yeah. Mm. Um, I had used, right in the beginning, this idea about, well, we're looking at relief of suffering. Well, their first question is, that, is, is then, if I'm going to talk to black bishops and pastors, um, they'll look at me and say, well, we already do that. What are you talking about? Why are you coming here to tell me how to look after my people when we already do that? So my question is, when, when we're actually going into these different communities, is the why um, they, they would need it, their, their question back to me is to turn around and say, well, why do I need this? What are you doing that's different to what we've already have? And so my so that's part of that whole approach of when we go elsewhere, Byron mentioned it, about when we go elsewhere, this missionary approach of going in and assuming that this is what this community is saying they're actually needing. If we do it overseas, we never do that. When we go overseas, we, we actually go and we listen first Yes. And then we build. But when we do it here, because we all speak English, supposedly, yeah, um, we come with the idea that what we are saying, people are going to understand and they're going to want it. And, and it's just yeah. that question on the approach in this country that we take. Is that different to the approach that we would take if we go elsewhere? Because yeah. we all sp supposedly speak the same language. Okay. So, thank you. So, yes, do we make assumptions that we know what communities need? Do we, in a way that we wouldn't if we were going overseas, do we um, have a pre-packaged solution to, you know, to their issues? Um, yeah, anyone would like to comment? So, I have a, 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 an observation, which is... Which is <laughs> This is, this is very nuanced, and it's about understanding the, the unexpressed shared experience that people come into a room in the hope that people will know what they're coming to talk about, or to at least resolve. Um, and that, that, and it's, it raises a very interesting question about the kind of formula you use for mindfulness communities, by the way. So, for example, you know, having been teaching around issues of inclusion, one of the things that often comes up, particularly when I've been working with black workers groups, is like, why have you got a group of people all from one group working together? And often the reason for that is that people don't have to explain themselves about the, their experiences of suffering in a way that, that feels in itself re revisiting suffering. 
you know, the idea that people will ask people, you know, you know, when the question is, where are you from? It's often kind of like, it's not a geographical question. There's often a kind of a, an assumption behind those kind of questions. And if you've been born in a country and this is your home, it kind of raises a very different kind of narrative. So there's, there's something about understanding that the nature, there is suffering, but the question itself already predetermines that people hadn't thought that through. And, and it's not that you don't ask that question. It's about you work on the basic premise of how do I engage with this community as equal partners towards something that people might recognize already is something that people are experiencing and the reasons for why that, that community has become marginalized. Yeah. So I think it's incredibly nuanced, and I don't think it's as simple as saying this is a questionnaire we go in and we ask people, but it is about the nature of, of, of how do we yeah. understand and know. Um, and I think the same could be true around gender, the sort of thing about a person who has a sensory impairment. There's a whole range of differences that people will simply you know, um, tacitly or experientially know that are really important in terms of how we build, as, as you were saying, Rachel, about context, about people's lived experience. And, and, I, and I, think, I think as a mindfulness community, there's, I think there's a sufficient you know, capacity and, and engagement for people to understand that without it becoming what I often see as a kind of defensive reaction to something saying, well, why are we being excluded from something? Saying, no, 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 it's not about exclusion, it's about understanding the needs of those specific individuals or communities in that, in that present moment. Mm. Okay, thank you. I, I have a, a comment, which is, um, I think, I mean, these, these issues that we're talking about, I, I mean, correct me if I am wrong, Byron, um, but though these issues are true in working with different communities, whatever it is we're bringing in, you know, there's danger for, for the potential for that missionary um, zeal and the assumptions, whatever we're doing. And so why am I a mindfulness teacher and not a social worker? Um, you know, not, not to say that social workers aren't needed. For me, I think the extra bit is a focus on the mind. You know, a sense that there's, in some way, um, it's possible to, mm, a certain amount, an important amount of the suffering that we experience is to do with our minds and how we relate to experience, difficult experience in particular. Um, and that it's possible to access different uh, capacities of the mind and to gain a, a great insight, to have more choice, and, and so on and so forth. That's what I feel I bring into uh, the settings I go to. What that means for people, the language, the, the, the connection between that and their social set setting is going to be very variable. And I suppose then that's a question of sensitivity and, and adaptation and, and, and our models. But... Um, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be interested in this whole mindfulness movement. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that I felt we, we were onto something that is universal, um, even if it takes many different forms, and that is to do with the mind. And, and, and I mean, they have to add something because there are so many different ways of engaging with the mind. So it's a particular way of engaging with the mind, which seems to be quite helpful. So that's my answer, but Because I agree with you about the mind piece, and I, yeah. I don't think we can disagree on that. And I think that for me, the, the big ticket issue is about inequality. I mean, if you look at society and all the yeah. kind of tensions it creates, inequality is one of, the, uh, one of the things, and over the last 30 years, it's increased, not decreased. So there's lots of things we need to kind of address. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a wonderful example, if you've come across Ruth King's book around mindfulness race, she gives a really wonderful example about what people do when they come across particular struggles and suffering. And, and she gives this really good example about someone who was from, and it's the US example, but I could give, I've had UK experiences of this as well, so I think it's not unique to the US. But she talks about a, 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 practice, a person who come to talk to her about how she'd left her community because the, these people were very racist and she was pleased to now live in an, in an environment where they weren't racist, etc. And Ruth King's gentle challenge back was, so what would it be for you to go back to live in that place? Because that's your community and how could you then change and influence that? 
that, that place. Mm. Because it often feels much easier to go to the communities that are on the receiving end of things and help those communities to the uh, versus turn around and saying, how am I work with the suffering of communities in which people's way of dealing with the world is to lash out towards the world? Mm. You know, the sources. Yeah. And I've actually worked in a, I've worked in a mindful way with people with very right-wing views. Um, and it's hard work. But the point being is yeah. a different kind of way of working. I do that work because the direct effect is on people like myself and others. Um, but often the people who aren't necessarily as effective, it becomes quite difficult. I'm not saying people don't do that work, by the way, but I'm, and I think it's not, not disagreeing on the basis about, about the mind. Mm. It's about what are we paying attention to in terms of the work, the, the important work that needs to be done. And who's going to find it easier to do that work, by the way? You know, so, for example, somebody invited in a community, if you're part of that community to start off with, in a way, you can have much easier conversations than if somebody comes in and looks very different, who yeah. people automatically think, well, you're not going to agree with me. So I think there's something about, you know, from that kind of mindfulness perspective, there's something quite exciting about having people who can lean into those discomforts and be amongst situations that in the past they might have otherwise have avoided being part of. Yeah, I very much agree with that. Rachel would like to comment um, yeah, is there a mic that Rachel can have? Yeah, there's something I'm like finding slightly troublesome about the word suffering and um, how we're bringing it in and uh, the idea that, you know, I really get the fact that there's something about mindfulness, it's about how we meet our experience, but maybe speaking from my own community of those kind of people with high A scores, this, this idea of um, how we're meeting our suffering, there's something about what I've recognized is that uh, I got very angry about what happened to me and then the social, you know, the things that led to it and the things that came from it. And in terms of the mindfulness actually meeting my suffering, it kind of often quite negated my anger, which um, was, the, was the thing that for many of us, actually um, got us through, in a way. And mm. I think, um, I actually think anger gets a bit of a bad press in mindfulness and kind of compassion kind of world. Maybe not, well, no, I've done lots of Buddhist retreats. I think it, I think it gets a bit of a bad press. Um, and so uh, really looking at that systemic thing, um, you know, there's something there about how we're assuming, our assumptions, maybe it's about our assumptions, kind of thinking aloud really, our assumptions about suffering, that even if we're talking about suffering, what assumptions we might be making around that, that we're kind of, that's going a bit un unquestioned, and that kind of is my issue, has been my issue with some Buddhist retreats and, and with mindfulness, really, that they don't, there's a complexity to this, and it's a, a systemic kind of mm. piece to this as well. Thanks. Assumptions. Yes, Jenny. <laughs> this is such a rich conversation. It's really hard to work out what's come in. I probably won't be very articulate. Um, I'm conscious that, that I'm seeing two sort of timelines here. The one of um, mindfulness really developing and evolving in a very rich way from the different different paths people are taking on this. But at the back of my mind, this probably is a sign I haven't done enough mindfulness. I have an impatience that mm -hmm. the, um, you know, we have, we've been told that if we don't take action in the, in the world because of the way we live and what we're doing to our planet, um, it's not going to continue um, beyond the next six to 12 years, then it becomes unstoppable. And I see, um, mindfulness as having potential to do something about that because that um, trashy of our planet and the deepening inequality in our world and the sense of loneliness comes from our sort of collective mind being not working well and us being unwell um, and that many of the aspects of mindfulness could help to change that. Um, we need something that's quite catalytic. That we haven't got time to go for the slow process of so social evolution that we might have done in the past um, and you know, some people are working in a bottom-up way to make that happen and I think that sense of isolation and bringing empowerment through mindfulness 
could be part of that, so that's a question. Um, can it be, and what, what are the main things that we see w working there? But the other thing is the, the sort of connection of those people we know have the most influence in this, which are you know, variously described as 100 people in the world, and yet in, a, in what Stephen was describing in the sort of capitalist version of um, mindfulness, um, can that get through to some of the people who are most closely connected and could start changing the story of the way that we live? Um, so my final point is I really liked um, what Vishwapani was saying about the analogy of our individual brains and emotions and um, us as human society um, and our brains and emotions. And I, I, I do feel that the people in this room and those we're connected to are the sort of nodes and synapses that can help bring a, a health-giving um, mm. property to the way that we live. But that I have that impatience. I don't. Yeah. I don't think we can wait a hundred years for that. So a sense of urgency, and a sense that there is something to something really interesting going on here, uh, which I share. Anyone else? I, I have a comment on that, but but would anyone else like to say anything? Sorry. We have a little tutorial going on here. <laughs> Do you want to go? Ahead? I don't. No, I didn't. Um, no, I wasn't <laughs> okay. really going to say anything. Okay. Well, Alison, I invite you to. Um, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I'm also impatient. I think one of the things that mindfulness is very helpful for is that although it's often a practice that we do sitting on our own bedroom floors, you know, day in, day out. It, it is inherently a social thing and it is inherently um, a practice that opens us up to connecting with each other and with our environment around us. And the more we can tap into that. And I think one of the, one of the words I've not heard too much, I, I even strongly dislike the word mindfulness because partly it's overused and therefore becomes somewhat devalued. But I miss in that definition or in the term mindfulness, I miss the concept of heart, of warmth, of compassion, of reaching out. And that is going to be fundamental to us solving some of the ecological issues that we face. Whether mindfulness can do that quickly enough that's something I've been struggling with for a long time. I have my own personal struggles with that. You know, I make commitments not to fly, but I have a stepdaughter who lives in America. I'm not going to not see her. How do we start to resolve some of these paradoxes? Um, and how do we support those who are really doing the good work? And I think the issues around habit are very interesting. We're in habits around the way we buy things, the way we even use our energy, the way we move ourselves around. But it's not just individual habit that we need to challenge. We need to challenge the um, sort of cultural habit. You know, one example would be the cultural view that we have to always aim for economic growth. Now, I'm not an economist, but to me, it's a simple argument. If you're always aiming for economic growth, you need a continual supply of goods and materials to feed that. And that's clearly not sustainable. So we need to start challenging some of these collective habitual ways of thinking, really give support to the people in power who we really trust and believe in their values, and then ensure that our mindfulness practice contains the element of heart and care and reaching out that I think can be missing when we just use the word mindfulness. It implies mind only, and I don't think, I think that limits us. Mm. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, one of the things that really, how do we make mindfulness something that can be a lever for changing society more widely? Um, so I've, I've said before that I think the, the, the strongest resource that mindfulness has is people's suffering. 
and the, and the motivating power that that, that brings. You know, and I, we, I think those of us who teach see that all the time, that um, people really commit to those courses. But what frustrates me, one of the things that frustrates me, is that it's an eight-week course. And I think that as a, the mindfulness world, we must find ways to move beyond the eight-week course. A course that begins and ends and then what, you know? And, and uh, so much of what's been said is about context, social context, we're social beings. Well, we, that's why we, we need to make uh, mindfulness something much more social, much more cultural as a movement. Um, and I don't think we're really trying hard enough to do that as, as a mindfulness world. But, we're, we're playing catch up, trying to to be able to deliver these therapeutic interventions in uh, in many many different contexts. But we've got to get beyond that. Um, and the other thing I have to say, which I think speaks to at the heart, is that. Um, Personally, I don't know how we resolve all of these issues. And I don't think... Well, one thing my mindfulness practice teaches me is that when I start to feel like I do need to figure everything out, I need to take a step back at that point. And really, I think where, where my mindfulness practice directs me is to what feels simple what in the face of complexity the kind of simplicity that helps make sense of it what feels authentic and what i kind of know intuitively in my heart and and um i won't try and sort of articulate that anymore but but that it is that sense that there's something very potent in these practices that is a, a catalyst for change potentially on all of these levels, though what that looks like, I don't know. That's what keeps me doing it. I hope I don't sound like an evangelist. <laughs> Actually, I do sound rather like an evangelist. Yes, next, another question if we finish, yeah. I guess it's, it's, it's an observation and a question. I'm training to be a teacher. Yes. Um, I'm a leadership development person by background okay. at OT in the health service. But I came to mindfulness because of suffering. If you'd said five years ago I was going to train as a teacher and try to change the culture in the health service, with it, that would have been a surprise to me. But I think what I observe trying to learn to teach and embody it is how the system is designed to teach John Kabat-Zinn's work, which was brilliant, but was designed for patients. Most of the research has been done on that. I was told by a very leading academic who was teaching me at one of the major centres that I had to teach that purely. And I said to her, that's not specific for the context of leadership development that I want to work in. Yeah. I met Rachel and I said, Eureka, mm. there's someone that's doing things differently. So, so my background is developing leaders and, and adults. And so we need, the system is designed for the results it gets. It gets the eight-week program because we teach trainers to teach that. They're taught to teach that. They're not necessarily, although we've gone to the workplace um, sessions at Oxford, we're not necessarily teaching people about context, about how you work in organisations or different contexts as part of that training, or I haven't experienced that. It also, you have to be rich to train. So as a, as a white middle-class woman who's, you know, I found mindfulness because I had money to pay for it and the resources to find it at a difficult time in my life. I have money to train and it's costing me a fortune, um, but therefore I wouldn't have the access to train if I if I didn't have those resources. So, so some of those fundamental systems issues are there in how we teach people. Yeah. Sorry, it's, a, it's more of a statement than a question. Yeah, so talking about professionalization and, and what that then means for, and... And how we train people, because we train, we train people. people, and it's great, I'm not saying the eight week program isn't great, but that is held as, which came from John's work, didn't it? Um, yeah. and, and how do we help people make it context specific, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, Stephen. I could come in on that just very briefly. That I've noticed today one of the things that's been at issue is is whether mindfulness is one thing 
or is it multiple things? You know, and the former allies more with the universal idea, and the latter allies more with a contextual idea. I think this becomes very um, marked, I think, in workplace settings where you have two key other authors who use the word mindfulness, but they mean quite different things to that of the John Kabat-Zinn tradition. So I'm thinking about Ellen Langer, firstly, who's an American social psychologist who wrote books at the same time as John Kabat-Zinn, but coming more from social psychology studies of decision-making and thinking. Mm -hmm. And she distinguishes between mindfulness and mindlessness. Actually, if you work in education, you're perhaps more likely to come across her work on mindfulness and learning. And the other person that comes to mind is uh, Thomas Weick's work. Uh, Weick is W-E-I-C-K, and he uh, has been developing his concept of organizational mindfulness for many, many years, almost independently of both Langer's work and John Kabat-Zinn's work. So they all use the same concept. <laughs> They're using it in quite different ways. I think partly what happens in the workplace settings is people, the, the, the practitioners, the teachers in that setting are drawing on maybe these different concepts at the same time and some of the confusion comes because we're not actually distinguishing between them and what they mean. Mm -hmm. Those latter two are much more to do with organizational change work and leadership than the John Kabat-Zinn tradition based in meditation. Neither of those, uh, Langer or Weick, are based on meditation, the assumption of meditation practice. Mm -hmm. I think I found that really helpful um, and it keys into this idea of whether we and we need to be very careful of who we are, as the question uh, you know, was raised earlier, around what is counted as universal or not. Um, uh, yeah. And I've also okay. just very briefly found it really useful, again, from the history of religion. You know, like the point that Joe made, that the idea that mindfulness is a timeless, universal thing is a religious claim. I found it really useful to be aware that suffering is a very particular word that is used in Buddhism in very particular ways. And of course, we, all, we could say we all suffer, but when it's used in these contexts, I, I, it's very helpful to see it as a Buddhist code word in a way. And I don't mean that in a disingenuous sense. I mean it because we need to understand so-called secular mindfulness in relation to the development of Buddhism in the way that Joe described. And I think relating to that question earlier, I think one proposal I would have, and our research is, is in progress in the second year, but maybe we need like interfaith work between secular mindfulness <laughs> teachers and Christian mindfulness practitioners, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Jewish, um, Muslim, because you get actually all of these faith and religious groups are engaging with mindfulness in different ways. And to see the secular mindfulness as its own domain perhaps a new domain actually where the secular is becoming moved in more religious and spiritual directions but is partly informed by buddhism might help to address some of these issues around missionary zeal and evangelicism and be a little bit more upfront i think about some of the issues and the problems mm. it doesn't relate to your question exactly but it's linking the other two with the universal point from earlier and yeah i sorry i was holding on to those things for a while yeah <laughs> hope they're helpful yeah okay so Timing. Maybe one more question. One, one more question. Well, just did Byron, what just, you, do you want to answer, just, respond just to? Just a really quick response to the point you made. Um, I've been delivering um, a mindfulness-based program in health service about five years, and I've adapted all of them. So, so uh, as, as a background in action research, it's kind of worth noting that you can adapt these things. The other thing, which is more general observation, is, is that um, I think I mentioned earlier on, um, people won't sit passively by and wait for things. So um, there are individuals internationally who are developing programs for, for people to deliver training uh, in communities through understanding of those communities. So it's happening uh, uh, as we're speaking. And, and I guess, you know, and I think there's a, there's a desire for people to want to engage with that type of thing, but I think those things will happen anyway as time goes yeah. by. Okay, let, let's just keep going with this question. And if we've got time for another one, do, do you want to say something? No. Okay. So, um, I, uh, not being a stealth Buddhist, um, but an actual one, um, an overt one. So it's, it's just interesting to me that um, we have this modality, which is MBSR and its, and its variants, 
And then that, that is um, a sort of uh, distillation or something extracted from uh, a wider Buddhist tradition, as Stephen says, there's been a historical process over a century that led to that, right? So then you've, dis you've taken this bit out of a context. And then so much of what we're saying is, but this feels just decontextualized. And we need to recontextualize it in our, you know, our, our, our domains, in leadership training or a com community, wherever it might be, prisons. It's really the case you've got to recontextualize in prisons. Um, and, you know, f for me, and at the, dan at the risk of universalizing something, I, I do think about mindfulness in its, in its Buddhist setting. It's part of the Eightfold Path, for example, uh, which is really saying that, you know, there's this capacity that the mind has to know itself and to, to actually to, to be a balancing faculty between um, all of the different things that are uh, go to make up what it is to be fully human. This is a balancing faculty, but it needs to be contextualized in these, these other elements. Um, and yet, at the same time, there's another dimension that uh, to, to, it's not simply awareness, it's not simply um, uh, metacognition. There's what uh, sometimes called, um, Jonathan Rosen calls a, a sort of a soul-like quality that comes with mindfulness. So it's a particular, it's the awareness that arises when we pay attention in a particular way. So, you know, for me, when I engage with mindfulness in this decontextualized way, I'm quite aware that actually it's a contextualizing faculty. It, need, it, it wants context, it wants to engage with these elements. Um, and that's, I think, what if we're mindfulness teachers, we need to be alive to that side of mindfulness. So, all right, that was that me getting the last word? I think it might have been. Uh, one very brief question. Yeah, they, on question time, this is usually a funny one, isn't it? <laughs> what would the panel do if they were... Yeah. Okay, I'll try to do my best to be concise. Yes. And I hope, hopefully I'll be able to have my message across. Uh, I would like to invite actually, maybe Alison and Steve, and perhaps uh, Dr. Joe to... Uh, perhaps uh, answer this question because I don't have the answer and I'm generally interested on, on the answer. Uh, but the question is, we notice the similar pattern in terms of movement in the yoga community uh, decades ago and it's going on uh, where part of the yoga practice was transformed in the main part of a tradition or, or the main part of a practice. So we're talking about asanas that was very simplified, and it, uh, people nowadays, when we talk about yoga, they think that yoga is a kind of uh, physical activity, physical exercise you do f to get fit. Now we have uh, a similar discourse in the mindfulness, which is you are improving uh, your awareness, you are being more in the present, you are eliminating the suffering, you are trying to. Uh, I wonder whether the mindfulness is becoming the asana, of meditation. <laughs> is mindfulness becoming it's like the technique? Is that what you mean? No, uh, I mean the asana in the yoga is something very, very small in the yoga practice. Uh, okay. Mindfulness is foundational as well in the in the practice of meditation. I teach yoga and meditation, and I don't teach, uh, I don't use the term mindfulness, but we do mindfulness throughout the whole practice. Uh, is foundation. So you, something is foundation because you build something on the top of it. So okay. what is being built on the top of mindfulness? Is this concern uh, you came across to it? Okay, so I have a uh, getting this distinct impression that, that Rachel would like to answer this question. <laughs> if anyone else feels very, very strongly moved, maybe we could add something. But I think Rachel is, wants to say something. I'm here, sorry, I've moved, yeah. <laughs> um, only because I've trained yoga teacher 
and um, taught yoga for 15 years. And actually, this did become the debate in, in you know, what have we done with yoga? And even the, you know, and, and then science coming in and saying, well, actually, some of these poses aren't great for people. The fact that it's been made into exercise rather than like uh, tech. So basically, this has happened before. It's happened in yoga. What's happened with mindfulness has happened with yoga. And isn't that interesting? And how can we kind of look at what's happening in yoga? You don't really see that very much. So I'm very grateful you've brought the conversation up. You know, look at this, this is happening in yoga, now happening in mindfulness. You know, what's going on? How can, you know, how can they inform each other's debates? Yeah, the pattern's there. Exactly. It's exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing happened with yoga. Yeah. And partly, I think the issue was that you can't, it's harder to go and teach yoga in workplaces. You know, it is practically harder. We do it, but it's, it's practically harder. And so, I don't know, it, there's all sorts of reasons it hasn't quite made the same. But the same debates are there. And often you don't really hear people thinking, oh, that's happened already, actually. It's happened, this is it's happening again. Yeah. So, very grateful. And I think it's very valid. Great. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thanks for that question. Thanks to everyone who's asked questions. And thanks to the other members of the panel. Thank you yes, to all the panellists and to the speakers earlier, to Joe and to Rachel and to Dan and Jamie. And thank you to Professor Poggle um, and SOAS for host hosting this and to the Kensei Foundation, which has funded this event. Um, also to Jerry, who's our technician, and to the, the students who've been helping. And uh, to all of you for coming and, and spending your afternoon here and uh, debating these issues, which hope, I guess we've just scratched the surface of, but hopefully there's lots for us to mull over. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the weekend.